everyone and welcome to Cup to Hook Bible Chats. My name is Cynthia with Cynthia's Joyful Creations and today we're going to look at Ephesians chapter 3 and it's entitled The Revealing of God's Mystery. There are 21 verses I believe. Yes, 21 verses in this chapter. And before we get started, Let's just bow and ask the Lord to uh, join us as we get ready to study his word. Dear Father God, we thank you so much for being able to just set aside some time, Father, to study your word. You tell us to not only dig in and know your word and memorize your, your scripture, but Father, that your word would live in and through us. And Father, as we look at Ephesians chapter 3 today, help us to understand um, what your plan for us is. And as we're going to learn, it's not really a mystery because you have revealed it to Paul and Paul is going to share it with us. So Father, again, I always pray that we um, try to block out any outside distractions that may come our way. The phone may ring, the doorbell may ring. A loud truck may go by. Um, a child may need our attention. Lord, it is so hard. There's so many distractions. And the devil is going to be working hard to make sure every distraction possible comes about. But Lord, help us to dedicate this time to you and try and plan it in a time where the distractions are um, very few. We love you and we ask all this, all this in your name, in your son's name. Amen. All right, Ephesians chapter 3. We are going to start off with verses 1 through 6. And again, chapter 3 is the revealing of God's mystery. For this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for the sake of you Gentiles, surely you have heard about the administration of God's grace that was given to me for you. That is the mystery made known to me by revelation as I have already written briefly. In reading this, then, you'll be able to understand my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to people in other generations as it has now been revealed by the Spirit of God's holy apostles and prophets. This mystery is that through the gospel the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel, members together of one body, and sharers together in the promise in Christ Jesus. All right. So Paul's referring to himself as a prisoner of Christ. But before we get to that, Paul, um, when he was writing these letters, he was in Roman imprisonment. He was basically under house arrest. He could move about, you know, throughout the house during the day um, freely under the supervision of a soldier or a guard. But at nighttime, he had to be shackled to them so as there was no possibility of him escaping before appearing before Caesar for his trial. And he's on trial because of his missionary work on the behalf of the Gentiles. So Paul has been working for a long time trying to bring the Gentiles and the Jews together in a biblical sense of fellowship. All right. Paul sees Jesus as Lord of his life. And therefore, he sees himself as a prisoner to Jesus. All right, let's go into verse 7 through 9. I became a servant of this gospel by the gift of God's grace given me through the working of his power. Although I am less than the least of all the Lord's people, this grace was given me to preach to the Gentiles the boundless riches of Christ and to make plain to everyone the administration of this mystery, which for ages past was kept hidden in God who created all things. All right, so first off, let's talk about Paul. Why would Paul be so marveled at the grace that God has given him to preach and share this good news of the gospel to the Gentiles? Well, before Paul was Paul, Paul was a man named Saul, and Saul hated Christians. He persecuted them. He killed them without even thinking, without even hesitation. But then one day on the road to Damascus, 
God appeared to him with a bright light and blinded him. And Saul came to know the Lord in a personal way. And so God gave him a new name, Paul. And so now Paul has been doing this missionary work, trying to preach to the Gentiles. But even with all of that, he still marveled at the grace that God has given him, the specific and important task of revealing God's mystery to believers. What is it to preach? To preach is to announce good news, to bring entrusted with this news God's grace. Okay? Paul is passionate about the gospel, and he's passionate that everyone has access to the gospel, not just the Jews, but also the Gentiles. And he wants everyone to share in the fellowship of God's mystery, God's plan for us. All right, moving on, we're going to look at verses 10 through 12. His intent was that now, through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and the authorities in the heavenly realms, according to his eternal purpose that he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. In him, and through faith in him, we may approach God with freedom and confidence. Confidence. All right, first off, God's great plan is to reveal his wisdom through the church and angels. So God is going to use Paul to establish his church, his first church. Now, before we go any further, I do want to just kind of share a little bit of information. Again, we know that Paul is in this Roman imprisonment, and that's where the letters of Ephesians was written, is while he's in this Roman imprisonment. But also, while he was in the Roman imprisonment, he not only wrote the letters of Ephesians, but he also wrote them of Colossians, Philippians, and Philemon. And so that's just a little bit of... Bible trivia, tidbit, whatever. All right. Angels. Okay. We talked about the church. Angels. Why would God want the mystery of the gospel revealed to angels? Why? It's because angels are interested and instructed by the lives of Christians. This is what the church, or this is why the church is important. Because not only do we have these angelic beings watching and observing us, we also have the demonic beings, those of the devil, watching. And they're looking on, um, and God's intent is to teach them through us. The mystery reveals God's eternal purpose. And what is that mystery? It is to gather all the things that belong to Jesus and one day bring them up to him. All right. Verse 13. I ask you therefore not to be discouraged because of my sufferings for you, which are your glory. Paul doesn't want sympathy for his imprisonment. Okay? He does not want them to feel bad. He doesn't want them to feel like it's even their fault. Because Paul is still being used in the service of God's eternal plan, which in the long run is benefiting us. When Paul is writing these letters, when Paul is singing in his imprisonment, he's inadvertently also ministering to the soldiers who are watching over him, to the soldiers who are being chained to him. But either way, be, even though Paul is in imprisonment, God can still use him. 
when we're going through storms and turmoils and chaos in our life, God can still use us. When he brings us through those trials and tribulations, he can still use us. Paul is no different. So he doesn't want these believers that he's writing to to feel sorry for him. All right. Now, this last portion of chapter three is called a prayer for the Ephesians. Okay. We're going to start out with verses 14 through 19. For this reason, I kneel before the Father. All right. When someone kneels, this is a position of utmost humility. So Paul is saying, so for this very reason, I am kneeling. I am kneeling before our Father, before God, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with the power through his spirit in your inner being. So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and how long and how high and how deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. So Paul's prayer is to acknowledge God's purpose. And when he's praying, he's praying on his knees. He wants to be in that most utmost humility or position of humility. He's in the business. He's passionate about not only praying for these Ephesians, but also to the Lord. He prays that Christ would dwell in their hearts and that he prays in their hearts and would be grounded and rooted. So he just doesn't want them to have a relationship with God. He wants them to be truly, deeply rooted, to be totally grounded. So when those storms of life come, they're not so quick to give up. They're not so quick to be knocked over and knocked down. They're not so easy to let the devil have his way. He wants them to be rooted and grounded in their relationship with God. The love of Christ is not speculation. It is not guesswork. It is not feelings. It is not emotions. The love of Christ, the love of God, is something to know. He says in verse um, 18, that they may have the power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide, how long, how high, and how deep is the love of Christ. It's pretty big. And he's telling us, we don't need to speculate. We don't need to guess. We don't need to know it by feelings or emotions. We need to know that Christ's love for us is deep. And it covers everything. It covers all of our wrongs. It covers all of our sin. And then verse 20 through 21 now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus through all generations forever and ever. Amen. What can be higher than the fullness of God? What can be higher? 
nothing. God can do beyond what we ask or what we think. In verse nine, or excuse me, verse twenty, it says, "He can do immeasurably more than what we ask or imagine." God is able to do this in our lives now, not beginning when we get to heaven. The power works in us right now. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Wow. So summing this up, Paul is in Roman imprisonment and he doesn't want anybody to feel sorry for him because he sees through his hardship how God is using him. He sees the blessings and he's thankful, he's grateful because he's so passionate about the gospel and sharing it that everyone Gentiles, Jews, soldiers, everyone has the ability and the knowledge to know that gospel. The mystery is, is not a, it's not a mystery at all. That God loves us so much. His love it's not able to grasp how wide, how long, how high, how deep. Because it is great. And Paul is here to show us that God can use anyone. He can use anyone. He can take a man who hates people, who hates Christians, who hates anyone who has anything to do with God. And he can be so powerful as to turn that person's life around. To not only make them love him, but give him the wonderful opportunity of being the one to share the gospel. To bring people together. To close the gaps. To break the separations that bind them. To give them a common ground through the love of Christ. God can use you, my friend. He can use you right where you are. It might be a simple task. It might be in simple ways. Maybe it causes you to step out of your comfort zone. He's never going to give you more than you can handle. He's never going to ask something of you beyond your means. He's going to equip you. But the biggest thing you need to know right now is that God desires for you to have a relationship with him. God's desire is for you to know the gospel, to be grounded and rooted in it, to not speculate, to not guess, to not be moved by emotions, but to confidently be grounded and rooted in the knowledge that he loves you. And he can give you immeasurably more than what you ask or imagine. Because he loves you that much. What was the question? What can be higher than the fullness of God? Nothing. Because God is all we need. And through the love of his son, Jesus, we have eternal salvation. And Paul was happy and content in his imprisonment because he was passionate to make sure that everyone, including you and I, don't leave this world without knowing God's love and grace and mercy and forgiveness. Next week, we're going to look at chapter four and it's called 
living to God's glory. And there are, let's see, 32 verses in that chapter. All right. Well, this takes us halfway through the book of Ephesians. And so when we come back again, we'll look at chapter four. All right, right now I'm gonna put our prayer request up on the screen. And I just ask that as you bow your head that you pray for these friends of ours, these fellow believers, that God would meet their needs. He would heal their bodies and their circumstances that he would give them answers and direction to decisions that they need to make. And if there's anything on your heart that you want to share and you want prayer for, please feel free to leave it in the comment section below. Or if you want it to be something more private between you and I to pray over, then you can email me. But right now we're going to go ahead and bow our heads. And again, I'm going to put the prayer request up on the screen. And then there's going to be a little bit of a quiet time where the music will play. And I just want you to take that time to be still before the Lord and to just listen to what he may be trying to tell you. But also tell him what you know. Tell him that through Paul, you know the mystery. That you know the secret that's not so secret that you know that he loves you and he immeasurably wants to bless you. Praise him as Paul has done. Maybe you want to get as far down on your knees to humbly bow before him to show him how thankful you are that he has saved you from death, that he has given you this new life, and that he has given you eternal salvation. Maybe there's something else you want to talk to him about. But also while you're there, don't forget to ask him the desires of your heart. Again, this week we're studying blessings and the morning devotions. And part of it is coming right out and asking God for the desires of our heart. He wants to know. He wants to hear what we want. Does he already know what we want? Of course he does. But he desires to hear it from us. And right here in verse 20, it says, Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine. He knows what we want. But he wants to give us more than what we want. He wants to give us more than we could possibly ask for or we could possibly imagine or think because that's who he is he loves us that much so let's bow our heads and close in prayer
Dear Father God, we just come before you, Lord. We thank you so much for Paul and his missionary journey. Lord, we know that through his imprisonment, some of the most beautiful letters were written. And the one that he has written to the people of Ephesus, Lord, he's bringing them together to build your church. Lord, he is so passionate about sharing the gospel. He knows that deep down he feels unworthy. But Lord, that's just it. When we give our lives to you, we are not held back. We are not defined by the things that we've done, the things that we should hang our head in shame over. Because you've taken them and you've removed them from us when you presented your son to die on that cross for us, Lord. He took away that shame. He took away that guilt. And through that love, we can be given, forgiven. And Lord, through that love, we can be given your grace that provides us opportunities, Lord, to help others, to grow, to be used in ways that we possibly couldn't imagine. Lord, your scripture says that there's nothing greater than the fullness of your love. Lord, help us to be grateful and thankful for that love. Lord, some of us may not know or understand the magnitude of that love. And I pray, Lord, that you would speak to them right now, Lord. That their hearts would be open. Their ears would would be listening to your voice. And Father, that they would be filled with an overwhelming blessing that just tugs at them to accept you for who you are. That you want to give them everything, including a home with you in heaven. Thank you, Lord, that Paul did not give up. Thank you that he did not surrender to the environment that he was in while he was being imprisoned. Thank you, Lord, that he saw it as a blessing, as a benefit, that through the chaos, he knew that good things were happening. May we be so bold, Lord, that when the storms of life come tugging at our our hearts and our lives that we also don't give up we persevere we keep going because we just never know Lord when you're gonna call on us to do something great maybe it's in a small capacity maybe it's in a large capacity but what we do know is that you call on us every day Lord to share your gospel, to share your love. Every day you give us joy. So Father, help us to find our joy and also be joy. We love you so much. We ask that you look over these that are on our prayer list, Lord. We just ask that you just touch them and heal them. Father, that you glorify them that you pull them through the circumstances that they're in that are weighing them down. Father, show them a brighter and better tomorrow. We love you so much, and we ask all this in your name and your son's name. Amen. Well, thank you for joining me again for Ephesians chapter 3, and I look forward to meeting with you next week as we jump into chapter four, where we'll get a little bit more in depth with um, God's plan and purpose for the church 
and how it's divided into different departments within the church. And the title for chapter four is Living to God's Glory. And so until then, be joyful, you guys, and I will see you again soon. Bye.